Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's lectures. Uh, my name is Joe Redmiles and I'm the MC for the uh, uh, lecture series that uh, the Mothman Festival always has. Uh, at this point I'd like to, uh, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to thank the owners of the theater for uh, very graciously making the venue available to us for uh, this year's festival. And at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Steve Ward, who will be speaking on uh, the topic of high strangeness. Uh, Steve was born and raised in the Detroit area. Uh, he has college degrees from Wayne State University and New York Regents. Uh, Steve has spent four years in the Navy on a nuclear sub, and he's a regular attendee at the Mothman Festival and volunteer uh, with the, uh, some of the activities here. So uh, please welcome Steve Ward, who will talk on high strangeness. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. That is the Phantom Menagerie. And find my glasses here. First thing I wanted to do is uh, uh, just thank the uh, the organizers for making this weekend all about Carolyn Harris, the, uh, dedicating it to her. This was a uh, just to have a couple pictures here. This is her with Chip Coffee. This is back at the 2009 when we were at the Return to Mothman event in a very very chilly February. And she's here with you know who, <laughs> and she was a great lady. Uh, every time I walked into her diner, it was kind of like walking into mom's kitchen at home. Carolyn Harris. And now I'd like to, to recognize another lady. This is that shy and retiring Ashley Wamsley Watts. Okay, she doesn't know I did this. Um, she's been a major force in the, uh, you know, setting up for the Mothman Festival and, and the museum, especially all that creativity. But there's just another, another reason I've got her up here. Ashley, you see, has uh, a couple of nicknames for me. One is Steve from Michigan, which kind of makes sense because I'm Steve and I'm from Michigan. The other one's a little more colorful. It's, uh-oh, hey, something went bad here, I'm Brian. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there it goes. There goes the high-tech deal. The other, other uh, uh, nickname is a little more colorful. It's Geezer, as in old geezer. Which, uh, well, it's, it's a, you know, meant to affectionately, I'm sure. Uh, I'm only about a month away from uh, being eligible for Medicare, so it kind of fits. And as my friends will tell me, I'm getting a little crankier as the days goes by, so that's, that's all well and good. But there's actually a kind of a serious reason I'm mentioning that. Occasionally, you're going to hear me as an old-timer and a geezer wax nostalgic a bit for the old days, the way things used to be or whether we perceived it that way, or whether the, the manifestations that we, we study in the paranormal have actually altered somewhat. And this kind of re, re, uh, relates to something called, John Keel called the uh, reflective factor, which we'll get into a little bit later. Just to kind of give you a basic overview of where I'm going. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about three or four different high strangeness areas today. These are, uh, one of them is very well known, the others aren't so well known as those kind of hot spots where UFOs, Bigfoot, and everything comes together. Uh, I'll get to the underlying theme in a moment. I'll also be talking about three different researchers, a UFO guy, a Bigfoot researcher, and a Loch Ness researcher, and how they started out as a very, from a very flesh and blood or nuts and bolts perspective and went to something else, something more ethereal, something more paranormal. Uh, this is kind of an inside joke here. <clears throat> We've got uh, Bruce Harrington on the left representing the forces of uh, flesh and blood and uh, nuts and bolts. We have Fred Saluga on the right who represents the forces of the interdimensional. So this is sort of a paranormal smackdown. If you guys have ever seen uh, Fred speak or, uh, and, uh, and Bruce in the audience, you know what I'm talking about here. But you do notice that uh, this, it is actually quite a division in the field. What, uh, you know, what is going on? What, what is physical? and uh, and what is not physical. There's a lot of people that don't believe anything about that, don't look at the paranormal overtones at all. You see they're shaking hands and smiling. You should have seen what happened five minutes later. <laughs> okay. 
I actually think that uh, these two different ideas meet at one point and might help us understand what's actually going on. Now, uh, I am not an experiencer. I know a lot of you are. I know a lot of you have come into the, this realm, the paranormal, because you lived in a haunted house or saw a UFO or had some kind of experience. This is how I got started. The, the, remember the great books of Frank Edwards, those great anthologies? Uh, that's where I first learned about the Flatwoods Monster and uh, the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins and so forth. And then in March of 1966, I grew up in, uh, in uh, the Detroit area of Michigan. And we had, uh, there was some very credible, a wave of credible UFO sightings going on in Michigan in, in Hillsdale, uh, Dexter, Ann Arbor. And unfortunately, some of them got labeled swamp gas and that kind of stuck forever. But the one thing that uh, really kind of foreshadowed what I'd be doing, at least for one aspect of my life, and uh, actually has led me to this podium, was what happened the following November. And that was that November 1966 was the uh, first sighting of the Mothman, the first, actually the big one, that went across the wire services and hit all over the world. Now, John Keel wrote in the Mothman prophecies that he arrived in Point Pleasant with his black suit and tattered briefcase. Uh, my entrance was a little less dramatic. I was in my tattered Levi's and tennis shoes, came down in a green VW, found the local hotel late one Sunday night, uh, and then I went, drove out to the TNT area. This is back in 1977, a year after I'd read the book. Uh, back then you could drive around in the TNT area. And uh, I don't remember much about it, didn't know where I went, but I did find the old power plant. Of course, years later they turned it, uh, they tore it down. But now this gets to my, uh, the underlying theme that I hope is gonna bring things together a little bit because I am gonna be all over the place. Uh, <laughs> you recognize these guys, right? Well, the lady is Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who, of course, has spoke here yesterday about uh, winged humanoids in Chicago. My wife and I met Rosemary at the 2006 Mothman Festival. This was about the 29 years after my first visit there. She told us that she was studying uh, reports of shadow people. And the following year, she gave us some of the findings, and it turned out that a significant percentage of those people experience having those, you know, bedroom invaders, those strange shadow people experiences, they're also classic alien abductees. So what a strange connection that was. And that's what this is going to be about today, are things that seem to connect that shouldn't connect. <clears throat> Actually, I uh, interviewed a, a couple uh, recently from New Hampshire that because of the, those kind of questions, that those links that Rosemary made, I knew what kind of questions to ask them, and I found out some interesting information. Now, <clears throat> I never liked the grays, all right? Back in the old days, as a geezer, as an old timer, I can remember we used to have, uh, you know, from the, well, at least from the 40s, the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, we had some pretty cool aliens, all right? And the serious point to this is, the grays really didn't show up in mass until the 80s. Now, there was a few sightings now and then that uh, could have been called grays, but uh, for the most part, they, they were just kind of a variety of uh, different types of alien or entity or whatever they were. Um, some researchers have claimed that the grays didn't really show up in uh, uh, South America until the 90s. I don't know if I can verify that, but this book by John Keel, which came out before the Mothman Prophecies, is the one that really messed me up. Keel pulls, uh, every, pulls everything together in the paranormal. This is UFO's Operation Trojan Horse. He, he hypothesized, he actually uh, uh, threw out the extraterrestrial theory by the late 60s. And he hypothesized something he called ultra-terrestrials. And that was a sort of a, an energy or intelligence that uh, was kind of the, what he called the cosmic mechanism behind all this. He didn't think the manifestations were that important he thought that there was something behind all these that would kind of masquerade as UFOs and, and, and entities and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, this is a little bit the way I felt when I first read Trojan Horse, because it really uh, kind of messed up my paranormal comfort zone, so to speak. Now, <clears throat> This is simply going to represent the fact that a lot of things are not easily explained. 
The first area I want to talk about is a lot of people know about the so-called Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, this book by uh, Dr. Colin Kelleher and George Knapp, investigative reporter. This was first known as the Sherman Ranch. And then uh, billionaire Robert Bigelow, Bigelow Aerospace, who actually has put his own private platforms up around in orbit. He, uh, he bought the ranch after a while. He was fascinated by the paranormal and eventually set up a scientific team there. Um, this is located in northeast Utah. Now, the, the Shermans were ranchers. They were uh, breeders of high-end cattle. Now, day one, and a lot of you, I'm sure, know this story, they were still moving in. This uh, wolf, now there's not supposed to be any wolves there at all, this thing came walking into where they were, and it was huge, it was almost like four feet off the ground. It was tame, they were able to pet it, but at one point, it went after one of the cows that was sticking its head through a gate. So Sherman went and grabbed his 357 Magnum and shot it four times, and it didn't phase it. And then he went and got his 30 out six and shot it. It didn't kill it, it, it did phase it, it stopped looked at him, turned around, and walked off. And then he and his son tracked it for a while. The footprints ended in a swamp, just ended. They didn't sink into it, but that was just gone. Now, they saw that was the first thing that happened on the ranch, and it was pretty unsettling, but life goes on, so that's what they did. Um, they uh, Occasionally, they would see these wolves again, and some of the neighbors saw them, so they knew they weren't crazy. And they were, they were calling this, referring to them as dire wolves, which of course are extinct uh, for about 10,000 years. They're just giant wolves that used to exist. Uh, but they saw other creatures there. His uh, wife, Ellen, well, one time she was ready to get out of her car and one of these wolves was nearby. But then she looked off in the distance, there was a strange looking dog-like creature with a large head and long legs. They saw a variety of UFOs in the area, these giant black triangles. And if you do the research, you find that uh, this area was a hotbed for years. The uh, book, the UFO, uh, the Utah UFO display by Frank Salisbury documents a three-ring circus of all kinds of variety of strange craft. Um, all kinds of things. This is just a, 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 a sort of a Reader's Digest version of what happened there. One time, Sherman, uh, this is way before the, the, the research team came on board, he looked up in the sky and he could see this uh, sort of like a floating platform or something. He couldn't see it from all angles. As he drove around the ranch, it would kind of disappear. Well, one time, one of these giant black triangles flew out of it as if it was coming through a window from somewhere else. Uh, the NITS teams, the National Institute for Discovery Science that Bigelow set up, he, he bought the ranch, and in September 66, he set up the, uh, the team. Now, in the meantime, uh, uh, Sherman had lost a couple of cattle. One of them, you could tell by the footprints that it was running from something. Then all of a sudden the footprints stopped and something apparently lifted a thousand pound calf up in the air. The NITS team, this is, this is important, the NITS team covered uh, over 200 separate paranormal events. Not one of them repeated. Now how do you conduct a scientific uh, survey when the, the, the phenomena is so elusive. And then uh, one day they were, uh, they had just tagged uh, a, a calf. They went, it was, it was just out of sight, a couple hundred yards away over a ridge. The only thing that alerted them that something was wrong, the dog alerted on something and took off. Now the dog never came back. They went over the ridge and found, and I'm not, not gonna go into the details, but this uh, thing was attacked by some kind of a predator. It was uh, just horribly attacked. But they didn't hear anything, they didn't see anything. So they couldn't, it was totally inexplicable. The next uh, two nights later, the uh, livestock, the animals, the dogs were all alerting on something. Something was going on on the ranch. And so uh, Sherman and Dr. Colin Kelleher jumped in his pickup. He was determined not to have another, something else uh, be uh, lost to some kind of unknown predator. So they got in the, in the pickup truck. This is winter, it's the dead of winter, it's, it's pitch dark, there's no lights out there. They're driving along around the, the headlights sweep across something. They see a shadow underneath the tree. They pull up and they find it's a lone calf. It inexplicably has gone off from the crew. When they look up in the tree, and they can't really see it clearly because of the branches and the darkness. They see two yellow orbs, some giant eyes of something watching them. Sherman's a crack shot. He shoots it. 
He's sure he hits it. It hits the ground and takes off. Off to the left, in the shadows, he sees something else, another animal that appears to be some kind of a dog-like creature. He hits that twice and it takes off. So they go up to the area and examine the area. There's virtually nothing there. There's no blood, there's no footprints, except one footprint, round, about six inches, with two talon-like claws coming off it. So how do you, you know, how do you explain this? Now, the, the point with this is, if you take certain things on the Skinwalker Ranch and you isolate them, you can say, well, this is, this is some kind of alien intervention, ET, right? Uh, but if you look at the, or, or maybe some kind of, yeah, you know, uh, other intelligence from some interdimensional incursion. Um, but if you look at the whole, something else emerges, something a little more disturbing. It's almost, you've heard maybe the trickster idea. It's almost as if a unruly, mischievous child somehow is controlling some of this. Uh, there, were, there was other paranormal activity, and in the house there was a lot of ghostly type phenomena. Uh, things would go missing and then show up again. They would hear disembodied voices speaking another language uh, over their heads as if they were talking about them. Uh, Sherman was repairing a fence. I don't know if you've ever seen a post hole digger. They're really heavy uh, and hard to move. He set it down behind him, turned around, and it's gone. At first he had to, he, he thought somebody was playing a prank on him. He found it two weeks later up in the branches of a tree. But that's not the weird part. One time, this is before the uh, scientific team was set up, before they came over. Um, and when everything was going crazy and, and Sherman was at his wit's end, they were driving back to the ranch, he and his wife, Ellen, and he said out loud, he said, Ellen, I hope to God nothing happens to those bulls. He had these prized Angus bulls that he was concerned about, about half a dozen of them. When he got back, the bulls were not in the pen, the pen was locked up, and he's frantic. What, what the hell what could have happened? So he's looking all over, uh, he's trying to find tracks, trying to find some clue. He hears something and it's drawn to the, this old white trailer that has been unused. He looks inside, all the bulls are crammed in there, uh, alive, but in some kind of stupor. And then he, you know, he starts pounding on the trailer. They start to wake up and they, you know, because they're so confined, they kick their way out, knock the walls down and they're free. Now, I'm gonna, when I get to uh, a high strangeness spot in Wales uh, a little bit later, there's another strange case of, I guess you'd call it displaced livestock. But again, you know, how, do you, how, do you, uh, how do you put this in the context of aliens? You know? It could be. Now the first, uh, oh, I've been, uh, see a little, uh, get a learning curve here. There's your black triangle. That's a skinwalker ranch. Now, uh, the first individual I'm gonna talk about, Jacques Vallée, he was pretty much known as a UFO guy. I, I highly recommend his uh, works. He was, uh, the, remember uh, Close, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? There was a, uh, a character in there who was a Frenchman. That fictional character was a nod to the real Jacques Vallée. He was from France. Uh, he, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> He was trained in astrophysics, a uh, computer scientist. He came over in the 60s, colleague of Dr. J. Allen Hynek, another big name in the UFO field. His first book was, uh, that I read years ago, called Challenge to Science, fascinating book, covered a UFO wave in France in 53, 54. A lot of uh, uh, landings, you know, these uh, egg-shaped craft, uh, silver-suited humanoids, no grays. But then something happened. He discovered that there was a connection with folklore. He uh, focused primarily on Celtic folklore, but not exclusively. Uh, and, and saw that a lot of, uh, of the recorded instances in folklore with the fairies, the little people, were very similar to modern day UFO experiences. He cites the work of uh, two authors, Wentz and Kirk. Oh, let me, uh, did I jump over there? Well, I guess I took those guys out. Okay, that's good. Um, they, they were, uh, in both their books, which were written quite a while ago,
They went around and talked to people one on one about their experiences with the little people, with the fairies, much like we do taking you know modern day UFO reports. So these were not merely tales told by somebody's uncle handed down generation after generation. These were one on one encounters with these elementals. Now, uh, Elias Owen wrote a book called Welsh Folklore. Now, the, the thing is that, uh, let, let me give you an example of one of the connections. Uh, we have uh, UFO uh, uh, experiences with missing time, right? That's pretty common. Well, the same thing happened with the fairies. People would be abducted by the little people, but instead of having the, the standard uh, unscheduled medical examination, they'd be whisked away to the underground kingdom or inside a mountain or something like that and spend time with the fairies. Uh, the, they would have the same kind of strange time distortion, very, very similar to modern day UFO experiences. Elias Owen in Welsh, Welsh folklore, he quote him here, he says, it was believed that the fairies for a little mischief would carry unsuspecting men from one place to another in midair and then leave them to find their way home. Sounds a little bit like a modern day alien abduction. Uh, Scandinavian elves had big heads, long arms, and short legs. What does that sound like? They probably had a great paddler too, huh? Now we've all heard of, uh, I'm going to make some connections here. We've all heard of vehicle stoppages with UFOs. We assume that there's something going on with the, uh, the propulsion system, electromagnetic forces, or whatever, that is causing this. Well, there are some other strange cases here. Um, now, I don't know if any of you have been to Gettysburg. If, has anybody ever seen a what they think is a phantom soldier or a phantom army even? There are several cases that in, in England recorded where they see these phantom armies appear. They can tell where they're supposed to be from because of the uniforms they're wearing. They will even hear the, the, the hoofbeats of, from horses. They'll hear noises and so forth. This was in November 1960, Northumberland, England. Dorothy Strong is in, uh, in a taxi. She, uh, they see this phantom army appear before them. The taxi stalls. The meter, the fare meter, starts going crazy, and they're feeling like they're being buffered against an invisible field. The, the army dissipates, goes away, everything comes back to normal. This is something I had to cut here. Mm. But that's not really the weird part. Here's the weird part. October 1960, West Virginia National State Forest near Marlinton. A man named W.C. Priestley is trucking down the highway uh, on two lane. All of a sudden his car stalls inexplicably. Rolls to a stop, he looks up, and he sees one of these guys. He decides to retreat back into the woods. He's able to start the car again. He gets a little ways down the highway, the car starts to sputter and smoke and spark. And one of these guys show up again, or the same guy. So how do we explain a cryptid? Now there are several cases like this, not a lot of them, but there are several cases where cryptids are, are, are seen to be involved in vehicle stoppages. Some more connections here. Another thing I find kind of annoying are crop circles. Uh, don't get me wrong, they make great, uh, great calendars, but all the controversy about uh, crop circles, uh, the claims of, well, I know an individual that has been to England and made them. Uh, with groups of people. Um, there are people that claim that they've seen them uh, appear all of a sudden in a few moments. There are others that claim that uh, Linda Moulton Howe did some research where uh, some people claimed that they, while they were out there at night making these things, the light ball phenomenon that you, that you see connected with these showed up as if they were observing what these people were doing. You know? um, But as a geezer, right, as, a, as someone, uh, an old timer, that harkens back to a simpler time, back in the 60s we had, we, 60s, we had something called saucer nests. Uh, there was a famous one in Delroy, Ohio, and this is quite simply where the craft, the saucer, whatever, lands, leaves the uh, circular area depressed in the ground and takes off. Uh, there was another one, famous one, this one is in Queensland, Australia. But as we it turns out, though, it may not be quite so simple because as we go back further in time, we find that uh, uh, these have been around a long time, even way before the modern day, what we call the modern day UFO sightings. 
And there were all kinds of lame attempts to try to explain these. Uh, there's the same lame attempts to try to explain Mothman as a sandhill crane. They would come up with some kind of uh, atmospheric phenomena. And if we keep going backwards in time, we find that there's another folklore connection because the fairy rings, the, the area, the circular areas of the little people, the elementals were seen dancing around, are indistinguishable sometimes from these saucer nests. Also, you'd see the fairy lights or the orbs or the UFOs or whatever context you want to put them in moving around these lights. But it gets a little weirder. Uh, Wentz and Sir Walter Scott, they received, they were collecting stories of, of encounters with the little people and these fairy rings. There was uh, several of them where mushrooms were supposed to be seen growing around these things. Well, it's a long time ago, hard to really put your finger on that, but they've always associated with mushrooms, with leprechauns and the little people, right? Of course, uh, we would never see mushrooms on a modern day UFO landing, right? April 1975, Jacal, Argentina. Uh, San Juan newspaper, they found a, uh, there was an area where they were seeing lights landing off in the distance. They went up there, they found a circle, there were landing marks of some sort, and around the parameter of the circle were seven, eight inch mushrooms spaced around the, uh, growing around the parameter. They found another one in, uh, Earlier in 68, it was actually investigated by the military in Argentina. Um, Ron Moorhead is the second individual I want to talk about. This guy was a, is a Bigfoot researcher. He started in the early 70s uh, in the Sierra Nevadas in California. He, uh, he's the one that uh, got to, Has anybody ever heard the Sierra sounds, those great Bigfoot recordings, right? Well, they were authenticated uh, by uh, Scott Nelson, for example, cryptolinguist. Uh, they really haven't been debunked. Um, so for years, he had, they had this interaction with Bigfoot. They didn't see them very often, but they got these great recordings. Um, and, but something happened. Actually, uh, it turns out Ron Moorhead and his partner, Alan Berry, who was a skeptical journalist at first, they, uh, uh, they recognize there were, you've heard, I think you've heard stories of uh, some Bigfoots having sort of paranormal overtones, connections. Well, they recognized there was something paranormal about Bigfoot very early on, but they were kept that very close to the vest because they did not want, uh, it was hard enough to get people to accept the existence of Bigfoot without the weird stuff. But in this book, you, if you see some of his conclusions, he says that he believes, Ron Moorhead, this is the guy that started out as a flesh and blood researcher, that uh, they're telepathic, they have their own language, can change their frequency to blend into surroundings. And uh, uh, there's some uh, very interesting connections with the missing 411 books by David Politis, which I won't have time to get into. That they are interdimensional, so they can change from mass to energy and back again. Very very strange for someone that came from that original perspective to say. And keeping on with that theme, uh, this lady, if you're a Bigfoot researcher, you'll probably recognize her, Autumn Williams. Um, she grew up in uh, Ording, Washington, when she, between about the ages of three to six, where a lot of strange activity took place. Um, I think when she was in her 20s, she asked her mother one day, she said, Mom, were there any strange animals when we were growing up in Washington? So Sally Shepard Wolford, her mother, wrote this book to tell Autumn all the things that happened there. Early on, she and Autumn were out when Autumn was only about four. They were gathering wood. They looked up and saw a seven-foot Bigfoot and one about half the size. So they had several sightings. But things get very strange. Uh, their, their neighbor, uh, Yodi, um, and, her, and her daughter, Emily. Well, first of all, Sally would hear these things moving around at night. Her, her husband, John, was, didn't want to have anything to do with it. He just completely ignored it. Um, but she'd hear them at night moving around, knocking over trash cans, moving through the woods and so forth. And she would hear what she called this rapid fire Chinese speech, which is very similar to what Ron Moore had gathered on those tapes. And in fact, Ron Moore had at that very time was out there making those recordings in the Sierra Nevadas. 
uh, Sally and the others would sometimes they saw the Bigfoots actually disappear before their eyes. Some of them seemed to give off a, a slight glow. Um, there were, they had, there were classic UFO reports. There were orange orbs that followed the cars. At one point, they could hear this machinery. There was something going on like it was going on underground. They're right near the Carbon River, so I don't know how there could be a facility under there. But they could, you know, a factory, you can feel the heat, smell, you, you, the, the noises and so forth. It was just like they were out in the middle of nowhere, but it was almost like there was some kind of a complex hidden somewhere that they were getting the rever reverberations from. Um, and it gets weirder. They, uh, they investigated a, uh, there was a situation where uh, back in 1959, there was an alleged crash of a C-118. Uh, a collision was something, and the, and the rumor was that it was a UFO. Uh, they went to investigate that. The local newspaper that would have covered that, those particular days that it would have reported on that were missing. Uh, they also investigated a meteor strike that happened in the early 50s, and around this time, they started being uh, visited by classic men in black uh, reports, or, or characters, like uh, some very strange looking guys. They would come to the door and uh, just ask strange questions, and it was shortly after this that uh, Sally moved away, and you know, it was all completely unresolved, but you had this three-ring circus of, of men in black, uh, UFOs and Bigfoot in one area. There's a serious man in black right there. Chad Holliday. He's the third individual I want to talk about. He was a Loch Ness researcher. Um, he was uh, 12 years old when the first, uh, well, when the modern day sightings came up. Um, the, the legends go way back, but uh, the road from Foyers to Inverness finally opened up in 33. And that's where he started getting some of these really early photographs and some of the, uh, actually we could call them more modern reports of Nessie. And he saw his, his first sighting was in 1962. He saw this uh, uh, off in the distance. He saw, he didn't see the classic neck or whatever you want to call it. He did see the, one of the humps and he estimated that the creature was about 45 feet long. He only had a few brief sightings of the creature over years. Um, but if you go back, this, this, the legend of Nessie goes way back. The, uh, the Kelpie, the water horse, and it's always been associated with being something evil, something negative. Not the cute little uh, plesiosaur you see on postcards with a Scottish tan. After time, uh, Holiday believed that, uh, that this creature, it was a flesh and blood creature, but he thought it was something more like a big slug from some of the descriptions. When you hear some of, some of the land sightings, this thing actually has come up on land and slithered about like a big slug, not, like, not with any feet or anything. Uh, this is what, he, he dug this out, this uh, Telemonstrum gregarium. Unfortunately, it's millions of years extinct, and it wasn't very long, but that was kind of the idea of what he thought this thing probably looked like. Um, and then that's when he wrote The Great Orm of Loch Ness, trying to promote this theory. And I had read this book, and in 73, that's a picture I took there, not a very good one, but uh, that was me standing on the shores of Loch Ness, wondering if that thing was going to slither across the road. Now, as time went on, there were several problems with this being a flesh and blood animal. Uh, you've heard of the camera malfunctions with UFOs, Bigfoot, haunted houses. The same thing would happen with Nessie. You'd get ready to take the picture, it'd be gone. They had a couple static cameras on the shores of Loch Ness, uh, creating kind of a triangle, and you can see most of the lock. And where was Nessie? Steaming back and forth in the area where she couldn't, you couldn't see her. Uh, there were other problems. Uh, Holiday examined many other lakes where these creatures uh, were supposed to exist. There, there's quite a few of them. Ireland, uh, Sweden, uh, uh, Canada. That, and, and they're very similar in description. The problem is that a lot of these lakes are very, very small. They have a very small fish population. And so it would be unlikely that a creature that size could exist, much less a colony of them. Also, he found out that this place was a UFO hotspot. 
That's when he uh, wrote the dragon and the disc. Uh, he found ancient carvings of the, the, you know, the mandala, the symbol of the disc, purity, in conjunction with the serpent. He thought there was a connection. He thought it was symbolizing in ancient times, good and evil. There was a uh, Swedish journalist that got lost in the woods near foyers. He comes across this craft or something, he thinks it's submersible, and some guys in diver suits. Turns out uh, they're not human, and they get in this thing, and it's a spaceship or something, and it takes off. He goes back to Sweden, and he's harassed by a man in black. These things seem to have reverberations all over the place. Uh, uh, Holiday himself saw several UFOs. He took several UFO reports. Um, and when you, you bring it up to modern day, Nick Redford last year came out with a book on Loch Ness, the first guy since Holiday back in the 70s to cover the paranormal aspects of Nessie. And Redford says that you, can, you find modern day UFO reports in the Loch of giant frog-like creatures, uh, something like a camel with a tusk, and something like a crocodile with a tusk. So Redford says either there's a heck of a lot of weird stuff in the Loch, or Nessie is still a modern, <clears throat> excuse me, a modern day shapeshifter. It was, uh, it was Carl Jung uh, that uh, Holiday had read where, where Jung was uh, talking about uh, uh, UFOs, uh, a modern myth in the sky being a kind of a human projection. He thought that Nessie may have also be something, some, some kind of a psychic projection. And then it gets really weird here. And this may have nothing to do with the fact that, uh, that this is sort of, seems to be sort of a high strangeness area. This guy is Dr. Donald Ormond. He thought Nessie was evil and needed to be exercised. So he went to the four corners of the lock, and including the center lock, of the lock, performed his exorcism. Uh, but then some really weird stuff happened. And again, this may have nothing to do with the exorcism. They may, this may have nothing to do with this area. But after he performed the exorcism, they were staying at a, a house by, uh, Mrs. Carey owned. That's where they borrowed the boat to go out and do this, this mumbo jumbo, right? So shortly after that, they're sitting inside. Holiday looks out the window and he sees some kind of a pyramidal smoke-like object moving across and then disappears. Mrs. Carey saw what she thought was a beam of light come through the window and strike him in the forehead. Okay, pretty strange, but kind of meaningless. The next day, Holiday gets up, <clears throat> standing on the shores of Loch Ness. He turns over and looks at the bank, and he sees a man in black standing there. So he walks over after the strange stuff that happened the day before, wondering if he's seeing things clearly. And he gets closer and closer, and uh, it's not really a man in black, per se. It's more like a shadow person, because there's nothing defined there. It's just kind of humanoid. As he gets closer, his intention is to bump into it to see if it's solid or just some kind of an illusion. And then it disappears. One year later, on the very same spot, on the same day, he has a heart attack. Now he survives. He survives several years afterwards. But, and again, this may have nothing to do with anything, but uh, Holiday concluded that, it was, that this was just a very uh, strange area and that uh, Nessie was, in fact, some kind of a paranormal entity. And this is the last uh, High Strangers area I want to talk about. This is uh, Dub in Wales. It's, it's spelled D-Y-F-E-D, -E but fortunately the, uh, the authors tell, tell us how to pronounce it. There were, uh, this is the Dub and Enigma. This is again Holiday, the same, uh, the not Loch Ness researcher was the co-author of this. And they, uh, there was a wave of sightings in, uh, in Dubbin, in Pembrokeshire, in spring of 1977. Now, these characters were about seven feet tall, dressed in silver suits. The locals sometimes said they looked kind of like a boiler suit. Um, the trouble is that their arms and legs were usually abnormally long, so probably not some and, and there were, actually, there was a case where a couple of kids got a hold of some boiler suits in the midst of all this craziness, put them on, walked around town, and scared the hell out of a few, few people. 
but they weren't seven feet tall and they didn't drive around in flying saucers. This is uh, kind of represents what they looked like, uh, but this was actually a photograph from 1973. There was a, a humanoid wave in the Midwest in 73, which is very interesting. Uh, this was a, a fake. This was a guy in a fire suit with a few embellishments with aluminum foil. Not the most convincing alien, but kind of represents what they were seeing in Dubbin, Wales in 77. Rose Granville, Haven Fort Hotel. She was one night she was buzzed by a, a UFO coming low over the ground. The next night she's looking out her kitchen window while doing dishes. She sees two of these seven foot tall humanoids walking on her property, just walking by. Uh, again, this is, I'm just giving you very, very uh, uh, thumbnail sketches of these areas. 17-year-old Carolyn March. This uh, young lady was awakened one morning with a bright light through her window. She looks, uh, she looks out the window, sees the classic egg-shaped craft. Uh, she does not see a seven-foot humanoid. She looks on the windowsill and she sees a three-foot humanoid on the sill. This character had long hair, slanted eyebrows, and a curved nose, spaceman or leprechaun. The Riverston Farm, Billy and Pauline Coombs, dairy farmers. They had a landing one night, some craft came down and then took off. The next day, they have just a hundred cattle end up and they're gone, a hundred cattle. They find them a half mile away on the Broadmoor Farm. Now, the problem is, that if somebody was playing a prank, you have to, now the, the gate is locked up, and they've always locked it with a deadbolt, they strapped it up in case the, the, the cows bumped against it. The problem is that for the, somebody to pull a crazy prank like this, you know, hey, uh, Sid, let's, let's get 100 cattle over here and you know, mess with them. Um, it has to go by their bedroom window where they're sleeping. And it could be sound sleepers, but the other problem is the Broadmoor Farm, they have to go down a straight line and they go off at a 90 degree angle in order to do this. Shortly thereafter, Billy separates 16 of these cows because he's going, they're going to be milking them. He turns around, he goes into the barn, turns on the milking machines, turns back around, and the 16 cows are gone. They're down at the Broadmoor Farm again. So, uh, Hugh and Holiday, when they try to uh, Oh, we're not there yet. Oh, that's scary. That's foreshadowing. That's what that is. <clears throat> uh, they, they, always were, they made a lot of connections with folklore here. And they, I mean, they were just speculating, obviously, but they found the old tales of the milkmaid who would put her cow and pin him up to, because, uh, pin her up because she was going to uh, do the milking. And then it was gone. Later on, the little people came to her and said, you can't put the cow there because it's spoiling our food. Their speculation, their hypothesis is that these elementals, or whatever they are, uh, derive their food, so to speak, from earth energies or ley lines or something like that. And perhaps the proximity of the cattle is interrupting this somehow. Now, I don't know what, I mean, still it's like the trickster aspect. What, what accounts for displaced cattle in any situation? Cyril John, 64, April 1977, same thing. He's sleeping, he's awakened by a light in the window, sees an egg-shaped craft outside. Next to it is one of these humanoid figures sort of floating next to it. It's not on a platform, it's not on a tether. It's, there's the door and it's standing right there next to it. So he watches this thing, it slowly drifts over the top of his house out of sight. Flash backward 10 years, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Uh, a, a woman John Keel calls Mrs. Kelly. She's going to pick up her children at school. She looks up egg-shaped silver craft, a, a humanoid dressed in a silver suit, uh, door open, standing next to the craft without any, any support. The difference in this entity, or whatever it was, is it was, didn't have a helmet on, it had long flowing hair. Uh, Mrs. Kelly looked at this in a, a religious context, even though there were a lot of UFO sightings going on at the time. By mid-October, things were settling down. Pauline Coombs is coming back to, uh, let's see here, oh, we're missing a quick picture, oh well, that happens. The picture that's missing are these huge stack rocks that, uh, that, are, uh, that you see on the coast of Wales. Uh, they just jut up out of the ocean, like so. Um, 
Uh, she's driving along, I look corner of her eye, she sees some kind of a silver object just zoom by. It appears to her that a door kind of opens at one of these, the top of one of these giant rocks. It goes in, the door closes. She stops the car to look to see what, what, what's going on. And then she sees at the very top, a couple of these silver suited humanoids wandering around doing something and then they're gone. Okay, now we can do the scary picture here. Okay. I talked to a lady, now I'm making, we're making connections here and really strange connections sometimes. That's what is hopefully linking this together. I talked to a lady, I'm going to call her June. She was an older lady, uh, very sincere. Uh, she told me she had a story about her encounters with the men in black. So I asked her some questions to see how much she knew about the literature. And she didn't know that much. She, of course, she knew about the movie and so forth, but she didn't, hadn't read John Keel or Gray Barker or even Nick Redfern's more recent stuff on the Man in Black. Uh, she and her husband had just been married. They were in, uh, it was the 1960s in near Las Vegas. Um, uh, they were picked up, they were hitchhiking, they, they were picked up by a black car. She didn't remember the make or model or anything. Inside were two pretty classic MIB types. Uh, black suits, black fedoras. Uh, I asked her about the facial features because as we know, some, sometimes they're supposed to look pretty strange, but they look pretty normal to her. One thing she said was the dashboard was all lit up, had all kinds of strange things going on, controls and so forth, which is a something that shows up in a few of these men in black reports. Mm -hmm. So they took them along their way. They got to the point where they wanted to be let out. And one of them turned and said, you know, we, we think you should wait a little while before you leave. And then they both fell asleep. After a while, they woke up, and then they, they got out and went, out, went on their way. Now, at all this time, they're not thinking how odd everything is. It's later on, they put it together and think, man, was that weird. So they walk to a small motel, and they walk inside, and the proprietor takes one look at them and just about falls over, and he says, my God, it's a good thing you guys didn't get here any earlier. And she said, well, why? And he said, well, there was another couple, and apparently this other couple looked uh, similar to them, not identical, but if a police APB had been put out, they would have been, could have been picked up. They had just robbed a store. They had been apprehended, and there was the danger was, was gone. But if they had shown up earlier, they may have easily been fingered for something they hadn't done. Now, here's the weird thing. There, there they are. Um, we know the men in black as harassers, you know, UFO silencers, really nasty guys. But uh, there's a, here's a magazine that actually is, uh, deals with, we've all heard stories of angelic intervention. People claim that uh, sometimes an individual or a group of people are in dire straits. A mysterious stranger shows up and helps them out of their difficulty and then they're gone. So how is it that men in black are doing good deeds? When does that happen? These are the only men in black that do good deeds that I know of right here. Now, let's see, time here, okay. Betty and Barney Hill, gonna sound like an old timer again. It's really, really good idea, I think, to go back and look at the, some of the old classic cases. Now, I'm just gonna give you a Reader's Digest version of what happened to them because the aftermath is what is so bizarre. Um, this is a classic UFO abduction, one of the first well-known ones in the early 60s. Uh, they were returning from vacation on Route 3. Uh, they had a close encounter with a UFO. They, um, they actually could see the entities through the window. They had missing time. They went home. They were having all kinds of problems. They eventually underwent regressive hypnosis with Dr. Benjamin Simon, and they uncovered a shared experience, these very credible, credible people, uh, medical examination. Uh, Betty had long conversations with this alien, and uh, it was all recorded in hypnosis. It was covered in mainstream press in that time, the Look magazine. Uh, they made a, a phenomenal made-for-TV movie where James Earl Jones starred as Barney Hill. Very well done. And I need to say that uh, the source for what follows is uh, Dr. Schwartz interviewed Betty Hill. And there's a, this is a great resource, Flying Saucer Review, by the way, which you can get on Kindle. And uh, his book has just been republished, Schwartz, where he interviews Betty. Uh, a little pricey, but excellent. 
And then Kathleen Martin, uh, Betty's niece, uh, talks about Betty's journals, and that's what is going to unfold here in a minute, because the abduction was the least strange aspect of the whole thing. The first thing that happened was, <clears throat> They, there was a great deal of poltergeist phenomena, classic haunting stuff that suddenly went on in the house. Um, one of the really strange thing that happened was Betty lost her earrings during this abduction. One day she comes home, she looks at the kitchen table, there's a pile of leaves on it, and her earrings are there. They were plagued by men in green, okay? What I mean there is there were several men that would come to the door in green coveralls. They'd come all the time and they would need to go downstairs and check something. She thought they were the gas meter guys. Well, what was going on that the gas meter guys needed to be there so often? Turns out later, the gas meter guys wore blue. One time they picked up the phone and heard something like base intelligence. So they knew they were being monitored. So some of the weird stuff going on was certainly human intervention. Barney Jr. was stationed in Panama. He's standing a late night watch. There's a gentleman all dressed in white that identifies himself as Mr. Geist, Mr. Ghost, proceeds to ask him all kinds of questions about his father and his mother and their experience aboard Flying Saucer. And this happens on several successive nights. Uh, Betty's family members start having strange phenomena. Uh, one night, a bunch of them, a group of them are over at somebody's house. A car pulls up in the driveway. They can see you know, through the window that somebody gets out, lights a cigarette, and they figure, oh, here we go. Another journalist, another wannabe UFO investigator asking the same questions over and over again. They wait, nothing happens. They go outside, check the driveway, no car there, didn't hear it leave. They look across the street, they see a giant ball of light receding across the street and then disappearing behind the neighbor's garage. But that's not the weird part. Robert Holman of NICAP, uh, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, he's the one that originally suggested Barney and Betty Hill seek regressive hypnosis, which worked out very well for them. He had another idea. He said, Betty, why don't you try and contact the aliens again using telepathy because they had some kind of telepathic communication going on, supposedly, on the craft. So Betty agreed. So here's the idea. Uh, Betty would, went out on her porch every night at 9 p.m. and sent a message to the aliens. The problem is they couldn't land there because it was too congested. They had to go to, they, she suggested they go to her parents' place, gives the address mentally, right, half hour away. So they're supposed to land there in this nice, convenient uh, field next door, knock on the door, and they would get a hold of each other and get together, okay? Now, I'm not sure how well they thought this out. I mean, can you imagine the phone call from her mother? You know, uh, uh, Betty, the aliens are here. Uh, you better hurry over. Uh, we're running out of things to talk about, and they don't seem partial to my shortbread. That did not happen. But sometime later, she got a call from her father, and her father said, Betty, you better get over here. She did. They told her a story about his, his cousin's widow, his cousin's widow uh, lives very close by, and uh, she uh, <clears throat> uh, she's in her early 70s, and uh, her last name is also Barrett, okay? So one night, she gets a knock on the door, and then a pause, and then a series of knocks. Now, she has no clue what's going on. She looks, sees out the window, there's a bright light coming in. She gets up and looks and there's a classic flying saucer hovering over her backyard. Not only did she not answer the door, she had no clue as to what they were doing. So Betty goes back to the drawing board. They, something weird happened, so maybe, maybe they're gonna hit Pater, right? Now the thing is, you know, Betty really didn't expect anything was gonna come out of this. So they were all surprised that they actually had something happen. So she goes, now you can imagine, <clears throat> she goes back and she essentially tells the aliens that you got the wrong place, you know, you got to lose the address. I mean, she could have said, you guys can make it all the way from Santa Reticuli, but you can't find the right damn house. <clears throat> so time goes by. 
her mother hears a knock on the door. And then there's a pause. This is late at night. And then a series of knocks. Now her mother, who apparently agreed to this, is petrified and doesn't move. Finally, she wakes her husband up. He gets up. They hear, all of a sudden, they hear a loud crash. Sounds like an explosion. The house reverberates. They forget all about answering the, I mean, don't aliens float through walls and stuff? They forget about answering the door. They go downstairs to see if the furnace is blown up or something. Everything's fine. The house is intact. But not only did they not answer the door, they did not get back to sleep that night. So, uh, and, and can you imagine what would have happened if either lady had answered that door? Would a full-fledged Betty and Barney Hill alien been standing there? Would it have been something more like a the wrappings or knockings you experience in a, in a poltergeist outbreak or haunted house? Um, but there went my, what was my perfect ET case. You know, this is, this is the thing I always went back to in, in the midst of all that weirdness we just talked about. This was the perfect case but not really anymore. Still possibly aliens, but how do we explain all this strange aftermath? So, you say, okay, Steve, why have you led us on this merry chase? We've been talking about window areas, um, sort of a phantom menagerie. Areas, the lines kind of blur between these different types of phenomena. Um, was John Heal right? Was he when he talked about these transmogrifications of energy? That the the the, the manifestations weren't that important. It was the, it was the what was behind the energy. Uh, is there a reflector factor where manifestations keep pace with our beliefs and expectations? You know, we, we start with the, the strange airships around the turn of the last century. I mean, before that, the fairies, the airships, the silver saucers. Um, there is a connection between past and present. I think that the same source of some of this, this folklore is identical to some UFO experiences. But there's not one answer. And we do have to deal with this, this duality, this, this seemingly physical side and the non-physical. Are we dealing with, uh, some have proposed that maybe some Bigfoots, for example, are real, but there's a counterfeit, like the one Stan Gordon uh, uh, investigated in, in Pennsylvania in the early 70s. Is there a counterfeit of the real? Is it a, a reflective factor of human consciousness? But here's, here's the deal. Uh, the underlying thing are the, the connections. Remember I gave the example of Rosemary uh, investigating shadow people and discovering that a significant percentage were also alien abductees. Um, you know, she not, did not say the right questions to people when they've had these experiences. So what I'm suggesting is this, as we go about our individual research, whether it be specific or general, to, so to speak, listen for that knocking because one of you may be the next individual that will uncover one of these unknown links that nobody else has and we may be a little further along trying to figure out what the hell is going on now a couple quick things and we're out of here 2003 mothman festival the statue was unveiled keel did this incredible uh, he, all his uh, his uh, uh, interviews were phenomenal but this one he said something that just totally floored me at one point, he says, you know, so many mysteries, people should stop trying to solve mysteries and, and live their lives. And I thought, spoken by the man who uh, tried to solve some of the most impenetrable mysteries of all time, I wonder what brought him to that. That was a showstopper. And lastly, <clears throat> our good friend Brian Zeller wrote a song called Mothman, What Are You Gonna Do Now? It's a great song that covers all the weirdness in the middle 60s, the, the UFOs, the Mothman, the Men in Black, it honors uh, Mary Heyer and Linda Scarberry, two ladies that are no longer with us, but were key players during that time. Um, I want to leave you with a line in the chorus, which is kind of a motif for what all of us are doing out there. And the line goes, Keel, go get your flashlight and chase down the Mothman. Well, that's kind of what we're doing, isn't it? Grabbing our flashlights in the dark, in the woods, uh, an old house, an ancient cemetery, maybe even a concrete igloo, in the TNT area, 
and chasing down the unknown. So, in closing, and with all due respect to John Keel, one of the very few times I disagree with him, this is exactly how we're living our lives, solving mysteries. Thank you. Almost every week I'm on Mac Maloney's Military X-Files, radioactive broadcasting. Uh, this young lady, Emily Mittemeyer, is on occasionally with me, and sometimes she's on solo. And we're going to do a wrap-up of, Mo of the Mothman Festival recording this Tuesday. Next week I have a special of just me, the best of Steve. So, man, if you didn't get enough of me today, you can have more. Thank you. You've been a great audience.